understanding energy metabolisms from the basis of understanding medicine. You eat a lot of things daily and it is important to understand how your body deals with all those nutrition and how energy is generated, what different hormones are released and what is the complete cycles involved in energy metabolism. This is Asif Qureshi and you are watching Dr. Asif Lectures. If you are new to the channel, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. In today's lecture, we will discuss about the overview of energy metabolism. I know many of the students, they, they start with a specific pathways involved in the energy metabolism, such as glycolysis, Krebs cycle, HMP shunt pathway. But here is my tip to all of you. The best way to understand and master energy metabolism is to first understand what is the bigger picture. And when I say bigger picture, I basically mean two simple things. Ask yourself if your body is in the state of plenty, which means have you eaten well, or is your body in the state of starvation? Now, why am I showing so? Because uh, your body behaves differently in these two different states. And throughout your life, listen to this carefully, throughout your life, you are either in the state of plenty, which means you have eaten, or in the state of starvation. There is no single day in your life when you are not in one of these conditions, okay? So it's important to understand the bigger picture first that if your body is in a well-fed state, if you have eaten well, what are the hormones which are released? What are the organs on which the hormones are acting? What are the cycles that are being initiated? What are the cycles which are being stopped? So the bigger picture first in well-fed state and in starvation stage. Once we understand this in today's lecture, the next lecture will be on a specific cycle and so on and so forth. We'll start hitting each and every cycle involved in energy metabolism. But today's lecture is dedicated to overall understanding the bigger picture of metabolism. So let's begin the lecture. Wow. Now, when I show this, uh, when I was making this uh, presentation, my kids were asking me, wow, Papa, you are, you are including so nice pictures in your presentation, uh, so much so that we want to eat uh, all of this, actually. So the question that I'm asking on this slide is, why do we eat? And this is an important thing to, you know, have the concept about it, that what is the purpose of eating? Why do we eat? Obviously, we eat because we need to generate energy, okay? And this is what is explained on this slide. We, in this lecture, we will go through two to three bigger picture uh, type of cycles where we will discuss that what is the overall uh, scenario when you are talking about energy metabolism. Once you understand these two to three big pictures, that will be a piece of cake for you to understand glycolysis, Krebs cycle, lipid metabolism, protein metabolism, but the bigger picture first, okay? So when we eat, we are eating basically fats, carbohydrates, or proteins, or a combination of these. You know that fats are uh, digested in your body and broken down into fatty acids. Carbohydrates are broken down into glucose, and proteins are broken down accordingly into amino acids. Now, all of these break down products, fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. You receive from them fatty acids, glucose, and amino acids. They all, after different pathways, they produce a central molecule, which is a two-carbon compound molecule. This is called acetyl-CoA. Now, acetyl-CoA is the center of energy metabolism. And once we produce this two-carbon molecule, it enters into a big cycle, which is called TCA, Krebs cycle, okay? And while doing so, uh, the two carbon, they are released as carbon dioxide. But what happens to the high energy electrons? They enter um, into the electron transport chain. Now, this is very important to understand. You know, master this before you move ahead in this video. Uh, stop the video, watch it again, unless you understand this. You generate acetyl-CoA, which is a two carbon compound, and it contains two electrons. The two carbons are, you know, we get rid of these two carbons as carbon dioxide, but what happens to the high energy electrons? Those high energy electrons are carried by these two molecules, NADH and FADH. They are high energy molecules. And these electrons from these carriers jump into the electron transport chain. And once it goes through the electron transport chain, what happens? Two things. 
the two electrons which were high energy at the beginning of the electron transport chain once it passes through the pipeline they become low energy electrons and those electrons then they seek oxygen which you breathe in and the oxygen is converted into water using those electrons which are now low energy electrons okay now what happened to the energy I told you when it was the beginning of the electron transport chain the electrons were high energy but when they exit the electron transport chain the electrons are low energy where did the energy go the energy has been utilized ladies and gentlemen in generation of a TP adenosine triphosphate which is the currency of your body which is the main reason why you eat all the day to produce ATP and why is this ATP important this ATP is important for every single thing you do your heart is pumping utilizing ATP all the transport the active transport that is happening throughout your cells throughout your body be it the renal cells, be it the liver cells or intestinal cells, active transport needs energy, it needs ATP. You are contracting muscles, ATP. So ATP is the major currency. You cannot do anything without ATP in your body and that is how ATP is produced. From the food to the breakdown products, then the central molecule which is called the acetyl-CoA and then the acetyl-CoA contains two carbon, also two electrons. The carbons we get rid of as carbon dioxide pretty simple and the high energy electrons are transported onto the carriers what are the carriers NADH and FADH2 and what happens to these electrons they are poured into the electron transport chain and after passing through the electron transport chain the electron becomes useless they become ah uh, they become low energy and that low energy electron seeks oxygen and water is produced okay and the rest what happens? Where did the energy go? The energy is used to transform adenosine diphosphate into adenosine triphosphate. Okay. Now this process. Now whatever you have eaten, half of the energy in the high electron, high energy electrons is captured as ATP. It's half of that. Okay. Not full of it. The rest half is wasted as an as heat. It's actually not wasted because we need heat to maintain the basal metabolic rate of your body you need to maintain the temperature of your body and in order to maintain the temperature of your body you need some heat okay so 50% of whatever we eat energy is captured as ATP and the rest of the half uh, generates heat which is also used by your body okay let us now discuss about a very important concept which is called the glucose tolerance curve on this graph you can see on the x-axis there is time on the y-axis there is bl blood glucose concentration and this is very important to understand if you want to understand energy metabolism that how does the glucose tolerance curve behave so basically what we mean is that when whenever you eat a lot of sugary stuff say for example you ate uh, uh, biryani or you ate any sweet custard or pizza or whatever so which gives you a lot of glucose in your body what happens with that glucose in your body so when you eat a high carbohydrate meal this is what happens your glucose concentration moves away from the basal value which is the five millimolar it peaks and after it reaches the peaks it does not stay at the peak it then comes down and then it is maintained at five millimolar if you are healthy okay it does not go all the way down and it never keeps on moving up so that is the kind of curve that you get when you eat a lot of glucose it goes up in your blood and then it comes down but then it is maintained at the level of five millimolar concentration in your blood and this is very important because this is all that changed when we talk about diabetes in diabetes the glucose tolerance curve is changed and we will discuss that in a moment but let me ask you a question here how much time do you think your body takes to absorb the maximum amount of glucose in the blood or in other words what is the time to reach the peak when does this graph reaches the peak and that is about 45 minutes so whenever you eat a lot of high carbohydrate meal it takes roughly around 45 minutes for your body to absorb all the glucose okay now the concentration of glucose the height of the, this peak it depends upon what you have eaten if you have eaten a lot of carbohydrate a lot of sweet stuff that will be a high peak if you have eaten low carbohydrates that will be a low peak but whatever the peak is 
it takes about 45 minutes to absorb all the glucose or maximum glucose from whatever diet you have taken, okay? And after 45 minutes, how much time does it take to drop the blood glucose levels, which means that the cells in your body, they start absorbing the glucose. So this is the concept here. You eat glucose, it goes in your blood, in the blood concentration goes up, but then the cells of your body, they extract glucose from the blood. And when they extract glucose from the blood, the glucose levels in the blood goes down. And it takes about 90 minutes. It takes about 90 minutes for the blood levels of glucose to be again at the basal value, which is usually five millimolar if you are a healthy person. So that's what the normal glucose curve looks like. But here's what I want to emphasize and highlight. Whenever you eat in the first 90 minutes, you have a time period which is called a transient, transient hyperglycemia. Now, why we call it transient hyperglycemia? Because during this time period, the glucose level is above the normal. The glucose level is above the normal. So cells have the chance to absorb all that glucose back in, in, the, in, the, in their cellular structures. Otherwise, if this transient hyperglycemia does not go away, this will mean that you will have high blood glucose level all the time in your body, a condition what we call diabetes. But this is the normal stuff. You eat, blood glucose peaks up in 45 minutes, goes back to the normal in the next 45, total of 90 minutes, and you are in a state of transient hyperglycemia for a short period of time, okay? Now, that, that's an important question to ask yourself that what brings the glucose back to the normal? So you eat, blood glucose levels go up. Now what happens in your body that your blood glucose goes down? Obviously you know that cells take up this glucose, okay? So how does that happen is the uh, discussion here that what brings glucose back to normal? Now remember insulin is important for that. Under the influence of insulin what happens? Uh, glucose enters into muscles as well as adipocytes, okay? It also increasing the metabolism in the liver. So this is what happens. You eat a sugary meal, a high carb meal, your blood glucose levels go up and now insulin comes into play. Hey, I'm here. Where's the high glucose? I'll get that glucose into the cells. Which cells? Muscles and adipocytes, okay? Also, it increases the metabolism within the liver. So insulin directs the show where glucose enters into muscles and adipocytes. Also, there are some other cells in your body which are independent of insulin, but they keep on extracting, they keep on extracting glucose from the blood. So this is why, because your cells use glucose, the blood glucose level does not stay at the higher peak all the time. It goes to the peak, it comes back. Under the influence of insulin, if you're talking about muscles and adipocytes, and without the effect of insulin, if you're talking about brain and RBCs, okay? So that's the normal stuff. You eat, glucose go up, insulin comes in, get that glucose into the cells, muscle and adipocytes, and brain and RBCs extract glucose anyways, without insulin even, okay? So that's the normal stuff. Now what happens in diabetics? This is what happens in diabetics, folks. In diabetics, the basal glucose level is not five millimolar. It's obviously higher. So this is depicted here by this red start line, which is higher than five millimolar. They have, they have anyways high levels of glucose in their blood, even if they are fasting, okay? But now when they eat anything, this is what happens. They also get a peak. Their glucose levels also go up. And this is obviously higher than the normal peak. And then their glucose levels also come down. They also have the down slope because in them, there may be little amount of insulin, or if insulin is absolutely not there, there are other cells. You think about it, brain and RBCs. They will anyway extract the glucose even in the absence of insulin. So because of those cells utilizing glucose, the peak will go down. But what will happen? It will not go down all the way because by the time it reaches to the high basal level, the person is hungry again, tries to eat again something. Glucose level goes again. Now, here's the point. The level and the time of diabetics for transient hyperglycemia is prolonged, which means that diabetics, if untreated and uncontrolled, they are in a state of hyperglycemia most of the time. And that's the problem. The high glucose is the basis 
for all the pathogenic mechanisms involved in the diabetic patients. So it is the hyperglycemia that you need to understand is the major major problem in diabetics. Okay, this is why to understand the normal glucose tolerance curve is very important. What what takes the the glucose curve to the peak? Eating. What gets it back in the normal person? Insulin and in other cells, even without insulin, brain and red blood cells extract glucose. Okay, what happens in diabetics? They begin with a higher basal glucose level. They get to the peak because of eating and they have a downslope because of the cells using glucose even in the absence of insulin. Okay, extremely important guys to understand the glucose tolerance curve if you want to understand the bigger picture of energy metabolism. Let us now discuss a very important picture about the overview of energy metabolism. Remember in the beginning of the lecture I told you there are two states of your body that you need to understand where you are always 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 in one of these states throughout your life either you are in a well fed state or you are in a starving state okay. So this picture will discuss about how your body behaves how your body uh, react when you are in a in a state of plenty for example in a state of when you have eaten very well a very good lunch a very good breakfast a very good dinner for example and your body in a well fat state this picture will tell you what are the hormones released how do they control your body's stuff and what happens when you eat good food let's begin this on this picture you can see there are different cell types available red blood cells brain liver adipocytes and muscle cells and we will discuss what happens to glucose when you eat a lot of glucose how do they enter these cells and what happens to that glucose as you know it proceeds in different pathways so let's begin first thing when you eat good meal which is full of carbohydrates what happens i told you in the glucose tolerance curve glucose levels in your blood go up okay so that's the first thing which happens the blood glucose levels go up now this glucose will enter in different cells and glucose does not enter cells without receptors there are always receptors which help glucose to enter in different cells for example glucose entry into red blood cell and brain cells is dependent on GLUT1 and 3 type of receptors now these are the receptors utilized by glucose to enter RBCs and brain okay now one thing very important to remember here that this type of receptor these GLUT1 and GLUT3 receptors they are the receptors with very very low KM value what does that mean that means it's a zero order kinetic reaction what does that mean zero order kinetic reaction means this glucose will enter red blood cell and brain cells regardless of the concentration of glucose in the blood dot I will repeat one more time make it easy for you so if you have high blood glucose or if you have low blood glucose brain and red blood cells will absorb glucose anyway they do not care about the levels of glucose present in your blood they just don't care about it they want they want glucose what regardless of whatever the concentration of glucose in the blood is they take all the time they absorb glucose this is what we mean by a zero order kinetic okay and this is insulin independent insulin is not required for entry of glucose in red blood cells and in brain cells okay so remember this what is the receptor type glut one and three what is it the km value it's a very low km value zero order kinetics what does zero order kinetics means it absorbs glucose anyways regardless of glucose concentration in the blood okay now once glucose enters in the brain cells what happens it enters into the routine pathway the glycolysis the trap cycle it generates carbon dioxide and energy okay what happens in red blood cell because there is no mitochondria in there the dead end is pyruvate from the pyruvate lactate is produced and lactate goes out in the blood and absorbed by the liver uh, for further metabolism okay so this is what happens to glucose in red blood cells and in brain cells important things to remember which type of receptor glut1 and glut3 km value very low which order kinetics zero order kinetics does it depend on blood glucose concentration for the entry no okay now these two cell types here the adipocytes and muscles in adipocytes and muscles the receptor for glucose entry are called GLUT4 receptors now these GLUT4 receptors are influenced by insulin 
So actually what happens is that these GLUT4 receptors are prepackaged, they're prepared, and they're present in the cytosol. Upon the interaction of insulin, they come up on the surface. More and more GLUT4 receptors come on the surface so that more and more glucose can be absorbed, okay? So insulin controls the entry of glucose in adipocytes and muscle cells. One more thing to remember about muscle cells, that if you exercise, exercise also increases GLUT4 receptors on the surface of muscle cells, okay? So, so these are the receptors. Now glucose will enter through these receptors and what happens? In the muscle cells, glucose can be converted into glycogen and it will follow the routine glycolysis and Krebs cycle pathway, which we will discuss in the upcoming videos and energy will be produced. What else happens? In the muscles, also you eat amino acids, protein, so it is absorbed in the muscle cells and generation of protein happens, okay? So that's the overview in the muscle cell. What happens in the adipocyte? This is what happens. Glucose enter, enters into glycolysis and Krebs cycle and produces carbon dioxide and ATP. What else happens in adipocyte is glucose is converted into glycerol phosphate and ultimately to triglycerides, okay, by addition of fatty acids. So up till now, what we have discussed, when you eat a high carbohydrate meal, what happens to blood glucose level? It goes up. In red blood cell and brain cells, they enter via which receptor? GLUT1 and GLUT3. What is the KM value? Low KM. What order kinetic? Zero order kinetic. Does it depend on the concentration of blood glucose? No, it doesn't. It enters these cells anyways, okay? What happens in brain? Glycolysis, carb Krebs cycle, generation of carbon dioxide and ATP. What happens in red blood cell? Pyruvate is the dead end, lactate comes out in the blood, goes to the liver. What happens in muscle cells? In muscle cells, glycolysis, trap cycle, carbon dioxide production, ATP production, protein formation, and also from the glucose, glycogen formation. What happens in adipocytes? Glucose enters, glycolysis, TCA cycle, carbon dioxide production, energy production. What else in adipocytes? triglyceride formation, okay? Is that very clear to all of you? Let's move on to understand what happens in the liver cell. Now in liver, the type of receptor through which glucose enters is called GLUT2 receptor and this is a high KM receptor and this is first order kinetics. Now remember this, when we talk about first order kinetics, it means this. Glucose entry will increase in hepatocytes if there is proportionally high glucose concentration in the blood. So the more the glucose concentration in the blood, the more the entry into the hepatocytes. That's what is a first order kinetic reaction, okay? So once glucose enter in the liver cell, what happens? It is converted into glycogen like muscle cells. Now one thing about glycogen that you need to remember is this. We produce or we can produce only limited amount of glycogen. We cannot produce unlimited amounts of glycogen. Why? Because in the glycogen structure, there is water attached. And because of the water, the, you know, it becomes very heavy and baggy type of molecule, and we cannot afford too much baggy stuff within our cells. Therefore, the cells, uh, the muscle cells and the, and the liver cells, they produce limited amount of glycogen. So, excess glucose enters, converted into glycogen. What else happens? This happens. It enters glycolysis, Krebs cycle, production of carbon dioxide and ATP. And pyruvate is also produced from the other byproducts such as lactate and amino acids. So when glucose enters into liver, it first converts or uh, regardless of the order, it can be converted into glycogen and it can be, uh, you know, entered into the glycolysis pathway, the Krebs cycle pathway for formation of what else can be done in the liver. The acetyl-CoA can also be converted into cholesterol and the bile salts and release of bile. Very important function of liver. And acetyl-CoA also is converted into fatty acids and those fatty acids, they come out of the liver packaged as VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. Now this is an important point. Liver releases triglycerides as VLDL. Okay, remember this point. Now, similar structure, something same as VLDL is also coming from intestine. What is that called? Chylomicrons. So chylomicrons and VLDL, they both contain triglycerides, but the problem is they cannot be taken up by the adipocytes. They cannot be taken up by the adipocytes. So they have to be broken first. They are broken into fatty acids and glycerol. And this is how, so, so who, who are broken? 
VLDL. From where is the VLDL coming? From the liver. And who else? Chylomicron. From where is the chylomicron coming? Intestine. And this is what happens. VLDL and chylomicrons are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. Fatty acids is taken up by the adipocyte and glycerol, only liver can take up glycerol, okay? Now, this is an enzymatically controlled reaction. Breakdown of VLDL and chylomicrons is controlled by, by an enzyme, by a hormone which is called lipoprotein lipase. This enzyme, this enzyme, lipoprotein lipase, is responsible for the breakdown of VLDL and chylomicrons, okay? And this is regulated by insulin. You see how beautifully insulin is controlling the show? Insulin controls the entry of glucose in adipocytes and muscle cells. Insulin controls lipoprotein lipase, which breaks down VLDL and chylomicron into fatty acid and glycerol. So insulin is actually in charge here. Insulin is the director of the show, okay? So that's the overview. One more time, very quickly, when you eat well, glucose goes up. Glucose enters in red blood cell and brain cells via GLUT1 and GLUT3 receptors, which are zero-order kinetic. Insulin increases the expression of GLUT4 receptors in adipocytes and muscle cells. Uh, in muscle cells, glucose gets in, uh, undergo the glycolysis and Krebs cycle pathway. It can also form glycogen and protein is also produced from amino acid. In adipocytes, glucose gets in and undergoes glycolysis and Krebs cycle can also produce glycerol phosphate and production of triglycerides, okay? Now, in liver, when glucose enters via GLUT2 receptors, which is first order kinetic, excess glucose is handled in the following ways. Number one, it is converted into glycogen. Number two, it undergoes the glycolysis and Krebs cycle pathway. Number three, it helps in the production of bile. Number four, it produces triglycerides which go out as VLDL and VLDL is broken down into fatty acids and glycerol by lipoprotein lipase. So that's the bottom line that you must understand. Insulin is the show director here. It is controlling the well-fed state, okay? Let's move on to the other figure which summarizes what are the uh, cell types, what are the organs which are under the direct influence of insulin. Adipocytes and muscle cells, you know that GLUT4 is the mechanism. GLUT4 expression is increased on the surface and more and more glucose is entered. So insulin is controlling glucose entry in these two cell types, okay? In liver, it is not directly controlling the entry of glucose because liver has GLUT2 receptor, but it increases the metabolism. So more the metabolism, more the glucose enters in the liver, okay? So these are the uh, tissues where insulin is, uh, you know, performing its action primarily. But these are not the tissues which are affected when insulin is not there. So for example, in diabetes, these are not the primarily affected tissues. In diabetes, it is the renal vasculature, it is the kidney parenchyma, it is the blood vasculature system, so arterioles, for example. So there are other organs which are involved and these organs are kind of spared. So this is an important point. In diabetic pathology, is usually seen in the insulin independent tissues, okay? Not the insulin dependent tissues. Now, what actually happens in diabetes? Why is diabetes so bad? One thing you need to remember. Actually, two things. Remember in the previous picture, this one, who was, the, who was directing the show? Insulin. So if insulin is not there, glucose is not handled properly. Your body does not know what to do with the glucose. And therefore, the glucose stays up. It stays high in the blood. So the state of hyperglycemia is there and, and, and this is the problem. So this, this little nasty molecule is the major, major fundamental thing that is the cause of all problems associated in diabetics. So if, for example, you have high blood glucose level and glucose molecule has a aldehyde group attached to carbon number one, and this aldehyde group loves to interact with amino group. Wherever it finds an amino group, it makes a bond. For example, there is an amino group on hemoglobin, which is in your blood, it makes a bond with this. And now, you know what is this structure known as? Glucose bonded with hemoglobin. This is called hemoglobin A1C. You test for it routinely, high hemoglobin levels in that. Now, does it make sense to you? There is more glucose available. So more glucose bonding with the hemoglobin between aldehyde and the amino group, more HbA1c. So HbA1c levels are therefore high in diabetics, okay? So, but remember one thing, this amino group is not 
present only on hemoglobin. It is, for example, also present on collagen. So do you think this aldehyde group will also have a bond with collagens amino? Yes. And what happens there? So when this glucose bonds with collagen, the lifetime of collagen is increased. It is not degraded. So it, it stays there for a long time. And in the meanwhile, new collagen is being produced. So the overall quantity of collagen is increased. And if the quantity is increased, for example, if it happens in the blood vessels, the lumen will shrink. You know, these are the major problems in, in, in diabetes, vasculature problems. What is the reason? Increase collagen, okay? This can also happen, for example, in many of the receptors present in your kidney tubules. They have a minor group. If this glucose reacts with that amino group, there will be nephropathy. So remember, glucose can bond with the amino group. Actually, the aldehyde group of glucose can bond with the amino group wherever it is present. If it's present on hemoglobin, HbA1c. If it's present on collagen, uh, all the vasculature problems. If it is present on kidney tubular cells or receptors, uh, the nephropathy. So remember, these, this is the major, major fundamental cause of why diabetes is so dangerous. Either there is no insulin or there is sensitivity problems to insulin. The body doesn't know what to do with the glucose. There is high glucose and that high glucose causes all these problems, okay? Now that we have discussed and understood what happens in the body when there is a well-fed state under the action of insulin, this is now time to discuss how your body handles uh, the metabolism pathways when there is a starvation state, okay? And during the starvation, when you have not eaten anything for a few hours, the major player, the major, major hormone is glucagon, okay? Now, what happens? In the liver, you made a lot of glycogen, you know? All uh, old good times when you were in a well-fed state, glucose was being converted into glycogen. Now, under the action of glucagon, all that glycogen is broken down into glucose and that glucose comes out in the blood. There are other sources of glucose generation as well. The carbon skeleton of glucose is also contributed by uh, pyruvate, for example, which comes from the protein breakdown. So that's an important source that you need to remember also contributes toward the generation of glucose. Now, why is it important to make glucose during starvation? Because you know that two cell types were taking glucose anyway from the blood. And one of them can depend on glucose and only glucose for energy generation. And that one cell type is red blood cell. Brain cells, if it's a prolonged starvation, can also depend on other sources, for example, ketone bodies. We will discuss that in a minute. But red blood cell, they definitely need glucose and only glucose for their generation of ATP. So we need some glucose in blood all the time and glucagon makes it sure that glycogen is converted into glucose. Now what happens to this glucose? This glucose goes into the red blood cell via the receptor, you know, GLUT1 and GLUT3, pyruvate, lactate, which also contributes to glucose formation. So glucose is being utilized even under the starvation phase by the red blood cells, okay? So that's an important message that you need to remember. Now, what happens in the adipocytes? In adipose tissue, the fats breaks down into fatty acids. Fats, we mean triglycerides, break down into fatty acids and glycerol. And you know, glycerol is taken up by the liver and only liver and is converted into glycerol phosphate. And we'll see how does glycerol phosphate contributes in the cycles in liver. But go back again. In adipose tissue, triglycerides, fats are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. Glycerol goes into liver. And this piece of breakdown is controlled by hormone-sensitive lipase. You remember lipoprotein lipase controlled by insulin during the well-fed state? This is hormone-sensitive lipase, okay? Now what happens to the fatty acid? This fatty acid goes out in the blood and is taken up by the muscles and in the muscles, it's burned to produce ATP. Beautiful thing to remember here. This is a starvation phase. We do not have enough glucose and therefore the glucose is not being taken up by muscle cells. The muscle cell is generating its energy from fatty acids. See how beautifully your body is saving glucose for whom? For red blood cells. So muscles are not utilizing fatty acids, uh, are not utilizing glucose for generation of ADP. In fact, they are using fatty acids. Now this fatty acid is also the source of energy for adipose tissue. So here is what's happening. The first thing was when there is a starvation phase, you have not eaten anything for, for a good few hours, 
first thing will be glucagon will order liver to generate glucose that glucose will not be used by muscles or will not be used by adipose tissue but it will be used by red blood cells okay so what will happen in adipose tissue in adipose tissue the triglycerides will be broken down into fatty acids and glycerol by hormone sensitive lipase and the fatty acids will be used by itself which means the adipose tissue and it will also be released into the blood and taken up by the muscle cells and burned into energy okay what else happens with the fatty acid this fatty acid this fatty acid also is taken up by the liver and in the liver it is not only burned to uh, energy by production of acetyl-CoA but it also produces ketones acetyl-CoA produces ketones ketones ketone bodies they get out in the blood and they are taken up by the muscles for energy production as well as these ketone bodies are taken up by the brain cells wow I just love this concept you see how beautifully your body is giving other sources of energy to all the cells so that glucose can be spared and saved for RBCs. So that's the mechanism involved for, for the whole um, starvation phase, okay? Save glucose for red blood cell because uh, the poor red blood cell, he can only eat glucose, nothing else. Fats, the adipose tissues, they can depend on uh, fatty acid burning. Muscles, they can depend upon fatty acid burning and ketone body burning. Liver, it can utilize fatty acids. Brain, it can use ketone bodies. But red blood cell, only glucose. So therefore, in the starvation phase, all the other cell types, they do not utilize glucose as their major form of energy production. And they, they save and they spare glucose for red blood cells, okay? Also, by utilizing ketone bodies, the brain is now not using glucose anymore so that more and more glucose can be saved for whom our little friend red blood cells okay so that's the that's the overall summary for what happens in a starvation phase who is the major major show director here glucagon it is saving glucose for red blood cell and all the other cell types they are using something else for energy production okay now this brings me to the last slide where you need to have this overall understanding that these cell types what do they use as a primary source of energy when there is a well-fed state and when there is a fasting or starvation phase so glucose is the primary source of energy for all of them during well-fed state but see how they change themselves in the fasting or starvation phase brain it starts on ketone bodies if it's long starvation Red blood cell stays on glucose. I told you that. They always, always, always eat up glucose. Nothing else. Skeletal muscle, they change themselves to ketone bodies and fatty acids, adipocytes to fatty acids and liver to fatty acids. Now, with this, I believe that you have a bigger picture. That when you eat a lot of stuff, what are the hormones in your body and what are the cycles in your body? When you are starving, what are the hormones in your body? What are the cycles in your body? Who is using glucose? So that's the bigger picture. Once you have command on the bigger picture, it is very easy for you to understand the individual pathways. The next video will be on, uh, you know that, on glycolysis, where we will be discussing how glucose is metabolized. So view the video again and again unless you understand the broader picture of the well-fed state the the glucose tolerance curve and the starvation state the bigger picture must be understood well in order to understand the secrets of life with this i end this lecture thank you very much for listening to me i hope you like the lecture please subscribe the channel and share the video with your friends hope to see you again in the next video very soon thank you